Hello, Facebook, and welcome. Today we are on Mission Unstoppable, and I have the most unstoppable guest I've ever had, I think. Today we're going to go on an unstoppable journey, and we are starting atop the Kifungi, Kifungi, Kifungulo. Oh my gosh, I can't, why can't I put it? Thank you, yeah. Kifungilo Mountains in East Tanzania, where a biracial orphan was raised by German Catholic nuns. This child, while beautiful, was even more fortunate to be blessed with greater intelligence and an even greater tenacity and drive. Despite the odds, she grew up to become an inspiring author, educator, dancer, entrepreneur, philanthropist, who would become known around the world. She is the author of the Dancing Soul Trilogy, the autobiographical books titled Africa's Child, America's Daughter, and Drumbeats and Heartbeats. She's also made it her mission to share her love of Africa, its culture and rhythms with America. And based on the African dances she learned as a child, she created a popular fitness program called Aerobics with Soul. It is my great pleasure to introduce you today to Maria Nambu, who prefers to go by the name Nambu. Welcome, Maria, to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Or should I say Nambu? You have had quite a journey, and it's, it's been an extraordinary life. And one thing that I've I said to people for most of my life is that I don't, it doesn't matter where you come from. Cream rises to the top. And if you're supposed to be, I do believe in fate, and I think that if you're supposed to be somebody, you will become somebody. And regardless of whether you know you come from an orphanage in in east tanzania or i mean i've met people from bangladesh the poorest poorest regions they rise and if that's who you are you will if you're an unstoppable human being which you are <laughs> you have you have really um encountered i think more pain emotional physical than many many people that I, that i've encountered in in my 12 years of doing this show and it's been extraordinary to see how you know you're, you're just a wonderful giving human being and and I think that's a real testament to to you and, and who you are the other day I know that you're a grandmother and the other day I was reading to my granddaughter she's she's a year and a half I was reading a book it was called are you my mother and I think it's a good place to start because because yeah. for you I mean and the children at the orphanage is like are you my mother are you mm -hmm. going to be my mother? And it's, what is this? It's so important that you have a mother, even though you, you know, you might've had some love from one of the nuns, you still wanted that mother. Yes. I think, I think all babies instinctively know that they have, you know, they have mothers or they have, they have one person who is more or less responsible to them, who will give them unconditional love. Uh, at the orphanage for me, uh, it really was brought to my attention because um, not everybody in the orphanage was an orphan, mm -hmm. you know, but it, it started out as an orphanage for me, orphanage for mixed race children. But then word got out that it was a good school also. So there were other couples who were married and who uh, were, were mixed race, and, but their kids, no matter, you know, whether they were loved and they had a home and they had parents, they still were discriminated against the society. So when this, uh, the German Precious Blood Sisters came to open an orphanage for mixed race children, they, the people who had families brought their children too. So it was hard for us who, who were true orphans, who didn't have anybody because very often the other, of, the other children there had their parents come to visit them. They brought them gifts. Every year they went home for holidays. So I remember for as long as I can remember, I was always wondering who is my mother and who could be my mother and where she was and why didn't she want me? I mean, I, I remember that was my first yearning as a child. And, and I think it is, it is just, it, we all are born that way. We, we, we search for that person, you know, who, kind of, who fulfills us, who makes yeah. us important. Who, we don't know that they brought us to into this life, but we must have that connection in the womb, and we are looking for that. And it was always the mother and not the father. I can't understand that either. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I always was looking for my mother, you know, and uh, I never it never occurred to me because at the orphanage, first of all, most of the people who came to visit their children were mothers. And almost all of them were African mothers mm -hmm. because very often the, the, the white fathers, whether they be missionaries or colonizers or tourists, they just appeared and disappeared. 
right. you know, very few of them were legally married and brought up their children together. So it was always the mothers that I saw and they were so nice to the children. And, and I always knew that I had a mother someplace. So I don't know why I never, I, but I didn't have any, any role models for father. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Interesting, isn't it? Um, so the sisters with all the best of intentions, you know, uh, were very strict. They were German. They were stoic. They were, you know, in this country. I guess they thought this God-forsaken country, and I've come there out of the goodness of my heart to raise these children. And and they did. I mean, there were some good things, I think, that they brought. Maybe, um, I know that you've traveled all over the world, so it sounded, as you were writing the description of the orphanage and the and the and and where it was located, that it was very Germanic, that it was like a little Bavarian town, let's say, in its pristineness, how beautiful they keep things. Um, yes. Was it like that? It was very much like that. It, it, you know, it could be just a little typical German town, you know, down yeah. the Rhine Valley, you know. Yeah. Uh, and the houses were made out of bricks. It's, you remember, we made the bricks, the children That's made right. them, and then we fired them, and then uh, they built the houses, but, uh, and the, the roofs were almost all tiles, and they were very well maintained. It was very well landscaped and uh, very, very, very clean. So uh, it really, and it was way up in the mountains and the, temper, and the temperature was just temperate. It was not the extreme African heat that you always hear about. So it, it could, people used to call it uh, the Switzerland of Africa. Okay. Because climate wise and visually, it was truly beautiful. They ate well. Yes. You kids did <laughs> so much. <laughs> I mean, you had me squirming. You had me squirming, you know, they called you Fat Mary as a, as a young child, maybe yes. three, four, five years old. Mm -hmm. um, you were always hungry. Yeah. You know, you can't just go to the cookie jar and get what you want when you're an orphan. And, and one of the, the treatments was it for mumps to put bacon on the face and you, and you guys would eat it. You yes. would take this yeah. off this child's because face because you're so hungry. Yeah, because bacon, it's, it's not like we were not, no, it's not always we were hungry, we were fed, but some of us were always hungry, but I think it was a deeper hunger than, than a nutritional hunger for yeah. the, well, physical well-being. So, uh, of course, they had all these homemade re remedies when we got ill, like, like once a month, we all had to take castor oil, you know, to cleanse our, our digestive system of worms. We all had worms. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and uh, when you got uh, mums, they heated up bacon, which they made from scratch, and we helped with all of that. We because you kept that pig. Bacon. That's right. And uh, and they heated it and just put it on our cheeks and put a bandage around it. But you know, not everybody ate it. But I always <laughs> used to hang around the. <laughs> The infirmary, and if I had a friend who had mums, I would go <laughs> in and ask for their bacon. <laughs> That's, that's funny. That's so funny. And and did the did the bacon cure the mumps? No, I don't know. It just brought the swelling down. I think the heat, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. But for them, then they would take the bacon out, take it cool down, and reheat it and put it back again. So so the nun in charge of the children, when she came and the bacon was stolen, half the time she knew it was me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and what was your punishment like, for that? Do I love bacon. Yeah. Did you, do you still love bacon? No. <laughs> No, <laughs> that's yeah. funny. Oh my goodness, uh, you were deeply religious as a child. You know, I or spiritual. Well, we were brought up that way. Okay, we we, we were Catholics, mm -hmm. so we had to go to church, and uh, and there were lots of things we had to do. There were so many services. We prayed and prayed and prayed a lot. We prayed a lot for benefactors, for people to come and bring food and clothing to the orphanage. So every time we needed something, you know, we prayed. But the, the outward, uh, whatever we did outwardly for religion, you know, going to church and all the rituals and all, for some reason, I never fully connected with them, even as a child. But I connected on a very deeper level with mm -hmm. my spiritual side, even, even as a child, because I think it was almost by necessity, you know, because I kept thinking nobody wanted me. My mother didn't want me. And uh, yet we were taught that um, we were all made by God. So I, I really believed as a child 
that I was a child of God and I didn't know who God was. I didn't know if I didn't have an image, no matter what, what statues they put out for us over here. I, I just never connected with it. I always connected with someone or something I call God or soul, but it was within me. Right. And that, that's what kept me always going deep down into what I figure made me a human being, what, what was the divinity, the divine in me, which I see in all human beings. It's hard, it's hard to comprehend how the, how the nuns took that, you're a human being, God, all are God's children, and yet you're God's unwanted children. Yes, they didn't call us that all the time, but but when, for instance, uh, the the white people came over to look at the orphanage, they very often came to visit. Many people came to visit because it was beautiful and to wander around the beautiful grounds and pick some roses and all of them. Whenever they came, we had to perform for them. So the nuns taught us songs, and we would go and sing for them. But but usually before the singing the nun would tell them about our plight. And that is the time they would very often say, these are really poor children. They have no father, they have no mother, they are half, they will never be whole, uh, they are unwanted. That's when we had the litany of all the things that we were. And, we, and, and of course, the, the people there, the white people were moved and they donated money or whatever they did. But, but that is when we heard a lot of all those adjectives that described mm -hmm. us they didn't call us that all the time but uh whenever we we were performing whenever we were asking for something whenever we were praying we were always reminded that we we had nothing and we had to work hard and we had to pray and we had to depend on the uh on the generosity of others and christmas would come and you get these a, a, a dress or a box from from germany somebody's yes Christmas was very special. I know I still like Christmas today because I remember at Christmas we were not beaten no matter what no what we did. We were given different punishments, but we were not you know physically beaten like we usually were. And always Christmas was special because of we just lived over the whole year for Christmas. And uh, uh, what the biggest occasion for us uh, was the in the chapter that I, I described, as you said, boxes from Germany. You know, Germans would collect clothes like here in America. People collect clothes for the missions, for the poor, sure. for Africa. For so we would go and we would get all these boxes, and we we got to open them and pick a dress or shoes for that was for the year. And uh, it was always a very very special occasion. Occasion, and that's where we got you know we got our presents, and and, and so Christmas was always special for me. It was extra special. Because I don't know if you remember, book one begins with me play, praying in front of the nativity scene. I'm praying to baby Jesus, and I'm completely having a conversation with him. I mean, yes. it doesn't occur to me that he's not going to answer. He answers me in my head, and, I, and he always told me that one day I would find my mother. And I remember starting out and saying, when the, how, far, how far away is one day? <laughs> I've been so long. I'm, I, you know, I didn't know what that meant and what, what he meant by one day. And I remember he said, no, your mother will come, you know, one day. So I had, a, I had a real relationship. And for me, even as I grew up, when I thought of my Catholicism, it always centered around baby Jesus. Ah, than the whole, okay. you know, like the Christ, the Christ or anything. grown up Jesus, you know, who died for us, which was, you know, we were, was drilled into us. I always had that little innocent baby who, who was a miracle and who could perform miracles. Yeah. That's beautiful. You, um, you, you, you got um, malaria. Yes. And you were very ill. Mm -hmm. And were you, were the children inoculated for, for things oh, like that? No, not no. at all. Like I wrote in the book, whenever we got, we had the, we got sick, we, every, aspirin cured everything. No matter uh -huh. what you had, you, we were given aspirin and somehow, maybe to psychosomatic, we felt better as long as we, we had the aspirin. But then they had certain, certain, certain medications like the castor oil to, yeah. to, to clean our, our system. And they made some ointments over there for, you know, when, when we had cuts and things like that. But we were not inoculated the way people are inoculated here. Yeah, yeah. So that's a real concern because um, there's some nasty things that, Mm -hmm. for especially for children and children's diseases and but you were fortunate you you went to a hospital and and were saved yes so that yeah. was a good thing yes and you always prayed to a certain statue was it saint martin 
that you prayed to? Yeah, he, he was at that time he was Blessed Martin. And, you know, because he was black, he was from Lima, Peru, you know, the Catholic Church, those days, they didn't canonize black people. Yeah. So uh, I think it was Pope John the 23rd who canonized him. And so now he's Saint Martin. But for us, he was always Blessed Martin. He was a mixed race saint. So that's why he was our patron saint. We always prayed to 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 him. To him. Oh, yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah. So where do you think that drive came from for you to become a student like you wanted to be away from there you you saw being a student being the best that you could be as your ticket your ticket out of there you got to go to school yes you know I I loved school because that was the one place I could shine and that's the one place I could I could actually help my the other student they had everything else but I seem to have brains, even though, because I asked so, so many questions, they always called me stupid. As far as I can remember, all through grade, fat Mary, I was stupid, and I was fat, and I was ugly. Those were the God. things. When it came to the class. Talk about self-esteem. <laughs> when it came to the classroom, though, I was good. I used to help them correct their slates and all of, you know, all of that stuff. But I, I don't know how. I just knew... I needed to get away from there and there was no other way because we were educated only up to the fourth grade so yeah. after that, you had to stay there and become a big girl and as you know the big girls are the ones who truly abused us yeah you know very very much so so i just couldn't imagine a life being there and being a big girl to a little girl and my job description would be to beat them yeah and i but i knew there was no other way i felt i, I didn't know what was out there in the world but i felt there was something I remember just hoping I'd get educated enough to leave the orphanage to go and be a maid to some white family or to, you know, to just go and work someplace in the, somewhere else. And uh, I just knew I had to have education. I had to speak English. And, and the other part of it is that I also knew that I had to depend on myself for everything. I couldn't, I didn't have a, a mother or father who would come and take me for holidays or take me to another school or pay my school fees. So I learned very, very early that I, if anything was going to happen, I had to make it happen. And I, I lived within and I really loved myself and I, I trusted myself. And, and when I look back and I, and I see all that has happened and how much I, I really pretty much survived and, and came out of, of some horrible situations whole i feel like i am whole in spite of all of that because i dealt with it at the time i went within me to solve the problems and mm -hmm. i loved myself and i and i really also remember saying if i don't take care of myself i'm going to die so and i wanted to live so much so i did absolutely everything and luckily i i as you know i created this fat mary i took this name that i detested and I made her my friend. And she was the inner me, the one that inner I child. talked to. And who always helped me out. And she was almost like, she was my twin. She was my counselor, my consoler. I always, always talked to her. I still have her today, as old as I am. I still talk to Fat Mary. So I, I, I don't know if it That's was that amazing. Or it was that realization that I was in charge of myself, of me. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. And <laughs> that, that you, that you, despite you're stupid and you're fat and you're ugly, that you, because look at all the other women in the world, like hate themselves, that you actually loved yourself. And that, that's like incredible. That's an incredible testament to you. Absolutely amazing. So you, you go off to school, you, you excel, you excel in school and you get to go to secondary i get grade eight you get to go up to grade eight now yes. and, and you have to leave the orphanage to do that mm -hmm. you have to go to a different school yes it was and, like 200 miles away yes and, and it was very difficult it was an all african school which means there were no mixed race children so there were like five of us who were brought there and we we stood up i'm telling you and and it was it we were ostracized even more it was like I always say, it was like jumping from the frying pan into the fire. And life there was so difficult that most of the other girls, um, girls from, the, from Kipun Gilo did not return. But I knew I was, and, and so many horror, one of, some of the worst things that happened to me in my life happened there, you know, when we came there. But I still went back because I knew I needed the education. Yeah. So it, it, and uh, we were, the, the Africans, they always said that we, thought we were better 
than them because our skin was light. But that was re a residue from colonial times because yeah. colonial people always made the Africans feel they were less than. And after all these years, it was so ingrained that you might even find educated African people and they somehow have this inferiority complex. So, so when we were growing up, the Africans told us that we thought we were better than them. We did not. We were treated horribly. So why would we even think we were yeah, better? Yeah, you don't belong to anybody. No, we didn't belong really to anybody. And, and uh, so that was a real, really difficulty. But I did go to that school and, and survived, you know, up until I finished the eighth grade. But even in India, the caste system was based on, on, on that too. Skin color, you're better, like you're smarter, you're beautiful, the lighter you are, exactly. which is and, ridiculous. And what we were called half caste, that is, that's Indian. It, it yeah. really, because we had lots of Indians from India in Africa oh, did you? for many, many yeah. years. So half caste is, in, is, you know, they have the caste sure. system over there. And so we were half, half caste. It came from the Indian, Indians. So did you learn English as a young girl, like from the very beginning? Or when did you start to learn the English? I know that oh, you really? learned it with a German accent. But <laughs> we spoke some, we, we spoke kind of like gibberish almost. You know, we, we learned English. And, but the uh, people around us spoke Swahili and Kisamba, which is the tribal language there, and the nuns spoke German. Mm -hmm. So, and the, the, the German nuns with their very thick accents taught us English. Right. So we had some horrendous English pronunciation and, and, and they mixed up the German and the English and the Swahili and everything. So we spoke what we thought was English. But when we went away and we started speaking, I remember when I went to, to secondary school, and uh, we, I thought I was speaking really good English. And uh, it was compared to some of the other Africans who hadn't had a chance to learn it since they were smaller. I spoke a language that I, I had no idea what people, I had to always say what I meant because it was a mixture of everything. But yeah. we were taught English. And then when we went to the middle school, we were also, there was an English class. We were taught, it was not the English you would ex <laughs> you, you think that most people spoke. Yeah, 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 that's funny. <laughs> I can just imagine. I can hear it. Uh, <laughs> so you, you. Let, let's move on. You're a little bit older, and I was very disturbed by, by the, the two priests who I think took advantage of you. Yeah, they took advantage of their station, and and, um, man, like that was very disturbing. Let's let's talk about them for a moment. There was two different incidences. Um, the first one, how old were you with the first pre were you fifteen or sixteen? I, I was sixteen. Sixteen? Yes. 16. So there's there's and a Catholic the priest. One, I think I was about eighteen, you know, uh, seventeen, eighteen. Yeah. But um, you know, I, I I when I looked I look back, I I it's not like I understand. I understand them or anything. It, yeah. it took me quite a while to figure out that they were taking advantage of me. But I think even then I knew it was not right. And because they were priests, but then they, they were just the nuns. You think the priests were God. They could do no wrong. Right. And even though, you know, the priest would do something to me, I didn't dare say a word because I would be accused and I would be punished. Yeah. And uh, so for a long time, I felt I, 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 I was young. I was just, you know, coming into adolescence. And when I got attention from, from the priest, I felt really special. I really needed it. I was just like hungering for attention. And, I, and that is what I felt was, was bad because they knew that and they took yeah. advantage of me. But me and my naivete, I believed them. I really believed everything they said. It took me until, you know, right be, it, many months later and before I come here to see the full picture that I was the, the right girl at the right place for them to use. Yeah. And then once, once they had used me, they went on their merry way and I was done. And, and I was left there alone holding all these emotions and feelings, wondering what happened and why are they here still having that trust until I woke up. Yeah. Well, it's understandable, you know, and, and it's unconscionable what they did. And they did it all over the world. So, I, mean, I know. And people are saying, you know, saying, well, because there's so much of this, you know, the abuse by priests in America now and all these cases, people are just saying, oh, it happened in Africa too. And I said, no, why not? Human beings yeah. are human beings everywhere. Yeah. You know? 
but it did happen and probably more so there because they there the priest would get away with murder literally yeah wow so you're at school you're excelling you're growing up in comes kathy she's a teacher yes She's yeah. a teacher and not very much older than you. You were now how old? I was, I was about 18 when I met her. And she, and she was, was what, 22? 23. 23. 23, 23. So Kathy is an American. She, yeah. her friends teaching, been teaching in Africa for a year, I think. And she yeah. says, Hey, you should come here and check it out. You probably enjoy doing this. And so she came and, and met you. Yes. And she was my English teacher for one year, my senior year in high school. Yes, and you know, she taught us oral English. So we had to speak, obviously, oral has spoken. So we, she was preparing us for the Cambridge exam. So she would have all of us tell, there were four of us who were chosen to take not only the English written test, but the oral one too. So only four of us were chosen. So we went to her, you know, so, so she tutored us and she helped us and she coached us. And she always wanted us to talk about ourselves. So the other African kids, uh, students would always say, well, my father... Is a farmer. I have two sisters. Uh, my mother does this, and we do that, and we own this. And they would they had all these stories. All of them had a story. Yeah. So she comes to me, and all I would say, I would say, um, I I have no parents. I was born and raised in, in an orphanage. End of story. And she she used to be shocked. The and but to me it was it was not shocking. It was the truth. Right. You, know, you so, lived it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So she looked into it and uh, on her own, you know, she, she came to the orphanage at Christmas and I, I always say she moved mountains and, and somehow managed by the time it was time for me to come to America, you know, she told me she would like to take me with her and she adopted me and she brought me here. It never occurred to me that she was only four years older than me. I, she, I was looking for a mother. And she provided every single thing I thought, you know, a mother provided. And I, I never, ever once felt the age difference. I always looked at, I didn't call her mom, but I, I, I gave her all, all the, the qualities of oh, a no. mom that yeah. I had developed within me. That's amazing that this 23-year-old wanted to take on this responsibility. I know. I always say, I thank God you didn't think it through. <laughs> if she thought it through the whole universe would say no <laughs> but she now I let's look at you i mean you how astounding are you not only now you know you come to america well we'll talk about that in a minute but i mean you be, you speak french you speak swahili you speak english you speak probably a smattering of a whole bunch of other languages having you know your husband was norwegian german whatever um just absolutely you know, mind boggling that this little girl from an orphanage who had nobody now is so accomplished. Right. Yeah. And I had lots of help from friends, you know, and lots of help over here. People did very, very much for me. And, and I always am amazed because they didn't know me. Like I'm always amazed with Kathy taking on this great big responsibility. And I tried to analyze it, but Fat Mary told me that it was because she didn't see me with her eyes. She saw me with her heart. Yeah. You know, when you see, when you live, when you experience things emotionally, there's no filter. It just comes out in your mind, you know, that you're always editing, oh, this doesn't make sense. Look, she's already grown up. She doesn't even speak English and she's pathetic. She's been abused. She's, that she had every reason not to take me, you know, but, but when you, when you have, we have love and you, and you, you are looking at somebody from that point of view, emotionally, there's no filter. You just want to fix it. You want to do something because you have it within you. To give she didn't have mother. a mother. How old was she when she lost her mother? She lost her mother when she was 13. So she didn't even really have this role model growing no. up. No, and she said, to, she said to me much, much later, when I, I said, I can't understand, you know, I'm just so glad you did this. I, I, it, it's still mind boggling to me how you took that chance. But she said that she... You know, she didn't have a mother, but just because she didn't have a mother does not mean she couldn't be a mother. So that, I think, propelled her too. I think she could identify with a lot of what I was dealing with. And you even, and, and that, what the year was, what was the year? It was, when we came here, it was 63. So in 1963, a single girl at 23 wants to adopt an 18-year-old African woman yeah that that's really something you know and yeah that is something especially at that time small town. 
you know, very, very small town. From, Wis and from Wisconsin or where is she Olamia, from? Olamia, Minnesota. Minnesota, that's right, Minnesota. Minnesota. Yeah, like farmland <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> that's amazing. That, that's amazing. You know, it was a small town, but the people, again, they all knew each other. They yeah. were all wonderful and welcoming. So whenever I think of America and, I, and my home is always that little town. Over and you really, you really liked her father, didn't you? Well, yes, I, her father was very, very good to me. Yeah. yeah. So I felt like as soon as I came here, you know, I belonged. I, 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 a lot of my worries of what am I going to do when I grow up, I remember, I, I always remember knowing that I, I wanted to live. I really, I knew that much. And I used to put yardsticks for myself. When I was really little, I would say, oh, if I could live to be eight, if I was <laughs> oh, eight years old, that Jesus. would be just the greatest. And when I became eight, I said, maybe I can be 10, maybe I can be 15. And then I remember my dream of all dreams was to be 20. Cool. And, uh, you know, because I, we didn't take life for granted. Yeah. People died to right and to left. We saw death in our face. Young yeah. kids. I could so easily have been one of them. So I never, never took my life for granted. And I was always so excited. So when I come to America, people, when it's their birthday, they're lying about their age. They're, they're cutting it. I'm adding, you know, because I want to, to let people know I've lived that long. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, I turned 75. Yeah, the day I turned 75, the next day you ask me my age, I'm 76. <laughs> I still do that, you know, over here. My and, daughter does the same thing. <laughs> yeah, and, and I know Americans are always trying to cut their age down. I, that always used to confuse me because I thought living was a badge of honor. Living was a gift. Living was, was, was just what we all wanted. And, and why would you say you haven't lived that long? I want to take credit for all those years I'd lived. Because they're just more, you know, uh, they don't want to look old. They don't want to be old. They're not, old people aren't honored anymore. They're yes, not revered I think anymore. That's part of it, yes. I want to talk about the first day in America because I think it's kind of funny how, you know, America, I'm, I'm Canadian, but Americans are, are, are rather arrogant in, in that they just think everybody's the same. Everybody's, you know, the same as them and brought up the same way. So you, you, you get off the plane and there's an escalator. <laughs> <laughs> it's an escalator. Yeah, yeah, an escalator. Like, what? And I'd never, you know, and I'd learned in English, I had learned the word escalator, but the translation they gave us, they say escalator was a moving staircase. Yes. So I have no idea of a mat metal. You no, know, all our staircases we saw were made homemade and they were wood. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I had this staircase, you know, that's moving. And then I used to wonder what happens when it gets up there? Does somebody bring it back down? Yeah. I, I, it was just so confusing, this moving. So I see this escalator and I have no idea that this is the moving staircase they were talking about. And I was so confused and I was so scared and I was carrying packages and I, I just did whatever every Kathy went on it. And so I'm still down there confused thinking how I'd get on it. And I see all these teeth of the steps coming at me and I'm petrified that people are coming in. This is in New York and we're pushing and going up and up. I, I get almost to the center and I'm petrified and I fall down. I'm hanging on to my packages and, and everybody steps all over me, walks around me, goes there and eventually hung on to somebody's trousers. And when I go there, I, I still can see him just, he kicked me, he shook me out of his leg, just like I was a piece of rubbish, you know? And I picked myself up and I, I remember at that point saying, well, that must be an escalator. <laughs> <laughs> so because, you know, one of the, the real culture shocks for us here is that, like you said, people assumed we knew all those things. And a lot of the stuff was like brand new. Like I, when I had to go to, to the toilet, I asked people for the toilet and or for the WC. And they said, restroom. And I said, no, I don't want to rest. I want to go in the... So little things like that. Yeah. And there were so many words. I made so many mistakes because I took everything literally because I hadn't heard them. And Americans also use words very differently from the British. Yes. So that, that initial, that coming to America... And, and coming and seeing that escalator, it, it, it just really has stayed in my mind how I had to be very, very awake. I had to pay attention. I had to ask questions. But very often when I ask questions, people will say, oh, come on, nobody's that stupid. I would be told that. And then I say, okay, here we go again. I'm stupid because I'm asking questions. 
you know. Well, but, I think the other funny the other funny one was was Dairy Queen. Oh, Kathy yeah. loved Dairy Queen. So hey, we're gonna go to Dairy Queen. <laughs> yes, so that was <laughs> and you're going, where's I the queen? That was too funny. Yeah. And now I get it, you know, but there was no queen. There was no queen. <laughs> and you did not like ice cream. No, I never did. Kathy was, had treated us in, in, in Africa in high yeah, school. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. And, you know, there's no ice. There's no refrigeration. refrigeration. So she managed to find some ice cream. And, and she I don't know how she managed to keep it cool for the whole day to treat us four of her oral English students. And she gave us some ice cream ice cream and she was aesthetic herself. She was so excited. She was just so excited. And she gave us our ice cream and we stayed there and we were just stirring it and stirring it and stirring it. And then when it had melted completely, we drank it. So, so and when she's finished, she asked us, well, what happened? What, why aren't you eating your ice cream? When, and I volunteered and said, you know, this, this food is cold. <laughs> she told us that's the whole idea. <laughs> <laughs> Supposed but to there are cool. things as simple as that. And yes. those are the things that really create a culture shock because your mind is on overdrive. You're trying to figure out everything. It's everybody assumes you know it. Yeah. Everybody, you know, who would know ice cream? And and I don't blame them, you know. But uh so from my experience, I would and all the things I wrote about, like in book two, you know, America's daughter, I'm hoping people reading them when they see an immigrant or somebody, a stranger, somebody from yes. another country who's unfamiliar with the culture. And they ask all those questions. They can realize that they really don't know, and 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 they could help. Or, or and you know, Africans have Ease this thing way. about strangers. Mm -hmm. You are always supposed to treat a, a stranger better than even somebody else. So we always reach out to strangers. Right. And when we see somebody coming from someplace else and they are new, people will go to them and make them always feel at home and try and try to help them. And very often here, when at least at the time when I came, I felt when people looked at me and I was new and I didn't speak English, they moved away nicely or they, they avoided me. And, and, and so it, it was hard to, to, to just break into and, and try to feel comfortable. Yeah. But um, I know that people must have been, especially men, were very attracted to you. I mean, you're a very beautiful young woman. When but you, you remember, I was scared of men, and I was, told, I was told that all men are evil. And I yeah. really believed that for a long time, because I was so afraid if I got pregnant, I wouldn't finish school. And that was my biggest fear, and I, I had no idea. As you know, there's all these chapters in book two that I'm trying to figure out how babies are made and all, because I yeah. nobody to teach me. One of the students there, you know, I said, became my grandmother, because most African tribes are taught in everything about being a wife, being a mother, they, they are taught at home by their grandmother. So I didn't have any of that. So I had to, to guess. And some of the children told me some really tall tales and I believe them. Yeah. And children learn silly things. I mean, even over here, they, they learn silly things and that have to be, you know, reviewed and go, yeah, okay, that's not quite how it works. <laughs> but yeah, so, so Africa's Child, amazing book. Now we're in America's Daughter and you're in America and just... You meet you meet Shell, you mm -hmm. know you meet your future husband. He's Norwegian, and and you have a good life. You guys have a pretty nice life. He makes a I lot have, of money. Yes, traveled around the world. You lived in beautiful homes, and and so life for a I little while. It, it did not start like that. No. When we got married, I always like to say this. Yes. Fifty dollars between us. And yeah. It was mine. Yeah, <laughs> he was even poorer than me. If that is possible, you know. Yeah. And we both worked very, very hard. Yeah. He was a very good businessman, and he made, you know, money very quickly. And we, we, we. He, he provided me with the with the lifestyle. I, I, I couldn't even imagine. You know, yeah. it was just way beyond anything I thought even existed. Sure. Even though when I know now that I'm older and I look around, it was not all that much considering how, how much more so many, how rich people are. Yeah. For me, it was just like everything. And, yeah. I, and so I, we had a very, very good life. And, um, but, but we worked hard. And I, but I never forgot that, that you know, I never took it for granted because I always, every time I would get something or have a nice house and, and we traveled and all, I would always think of, I wonder where my, my friends are. I wonder if they can come and visit me so I can, I can share this. I wonder if they can even imagine that, that I have this now and how could I even describe it? You know, but, but it was always to me, 
out there. It was, it, it never became something, you know, I possess. Like I've, I've always known that I could lose everything. I learned that as a child, Yeah. you know, that as long as I had me, everything else was truly secondary and needed it. It made life easier, but I also know, you know, I can live without it. It always makes me happy. I've been back to Africa many, many times when I go back to the villages and I see my friends and people whom I've known who have remained there. I always feel so good when they tell me, you know, Nambu, you have not changed at all. You're living in America, but you come back here, you fit right in, you have the same concerns, you have not changed. We were thinking when you come here, like some people, you know, they, they're, they're aloof, they have this, they want to associate with certain people. But uh, I, have, I never really left that, that part of Africa. It is me. It is part of me. And mm -hmm. I cannot separate myself from it. And you see that quite clearly in the book. Who I am. Yeah, you see that quite clearly, especially when you talk about, you know, the conditions of yeah. when you travel through Africa and, yeah. and the food and, the, and, you know, certain things you think. I mean, you become a princess in America, right? Oh, somebody, you know, asked me, and in America, <laughs> there was a reception once I was in, and uh, people came by, it was at our house, and someone came to me and said to me, you know, in Africa, were you a princess? And I, I always, I said to him, well, I wasn't then, but I am now. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because how can you explain my, my story? Where do you begin? Yeah, you know? yeah. So yeah. I always say, well, and and I didn't think I was a princess here, but but even then, you know, I I worked hard. I taught school. I I worked full time. I love to teach. I developed yeah. my. I always always worked, even though I didn't have to because I got pleasure. I worked for me, and I needed to to give back so much of what was given to me and what was done, and I felt I had it. I created my dance and, and I, I went to teach Swahili and African studies. You know, it was funny. I, I, I was online about a month or so ago and I started to get a Swahili word of the day. There's an <laughs> online Swahili. And I'm going I'm to impress her with my Swahili, but then I, I just kept forgetting it. <laughs> just, just too much going on. Too much going on in my life. Um, your husband didn't like Kathy. She, he didn't like your mother. He was jealous well, of her. Uh, what was this? He just couldn't understand the relationship that you had? I don't know. You know, he, uh, uh, there, there's lots of things which I described in the book, wh yeah. why that could be, you know? And uh, I think uh, he, he and, and a lot, and his family, some members of his family, they had something against people where, what, whom they considered overweight. Oh, and okay. so they were already, uh, already prejudiced against people who were heavier, even people within Got their it. own family. So that kind of started that. But then my special relationship with Kathy, and I also think Kathy uh, saw a lot, saw through him a lot. Yeah. And, and he couldn't fool her as much as he fooled me. You know, I was in love and, and it was just, as usual, he couldn't do anything wrong. I just felt every, until I started really knowing and feeling things for myself. Sure. But he was not a bad man. He meant well. We started out wonderful. I kept almost every evening I, when I said my prayers, I thank God, you know, before, after thanking for Kathy, I would thank my, my husband. He had, having a husband like that. Uh, it was a very good marriage, but things, you know, went back, up and down all over the place until eventually I just found myself because I needed and I wanted my family so much. I, I decided no matter what happened, I was going to stay, but I was really paying a big price. Yes. So, and eventually it didn't work out and, and I walked out. And kudos to you for doing that. I mean, really, I was very brave because you weren't young. I mean, you were well, youngish, but I you weren't young. I was 60 when yeah, and it happened when I decided to start alone. And it's hard to do that. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do that. And not only did that, but then, you know, you got hit. You got hit with cancer. Yes. At the same like, at the time. At the same I was time. Divorce. So, I mean, you, you, you know, you start your life off with beatings and then you're getting beaten at the end of it too. It's like, come on. Yeah. What's going on here? In the meantime, there have been lots of good things. There you were. can't forget those. No, you can't forget those. And you have beautiful children, like yes. wonderful son and daughter. And, and just so supportive of you and grandchildren. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's such a blessing. 
um, when you when you had to downsize your home, you had seven hundred over seven hundred pieces of of African art that yeah. you had to find a home for. I know. So, so how did you just how did you figure out who you're going to you know bless with it? Well, uh, I knew that you know I had to do something with my art a long time ago because I felt that they would become a burden for my children. They love art, but not as much as I do. And they yeah. not all the pieces that I do. Art is so personal. Yeah. So I felt that I know they would pick the pieces that they want. They wanted, and uh, I I wanted to to spread the word to educate people to to do something with the art. I thought I'd give it to museums, and I approached a few museums, but I I had a few conditions. I didn't want it to be kept in storage. And I didn't want people to have to pay to see it. And uh, so they're all these little kind of unique things that are just me. And uh, I had gone for a women's spiritual retreat at Alex Haley Farm in Clinton, Tennessee. Marion Wright Edelman, the, the, who was the president until recently of the Children's Defense Fund. That's where they do all their training of the freedom schools. And every year she had a women's spiritual retreat. So we went, I, I went over there and I saw this big area. They had many acres and it was, it was a farm that was owned by Alex Haley, okay, mm -hmm. the author of Roots. Roots yeah. And uh, they, they used that as the Children's Defense Fund uh, where they did all the training and all the programs. And I could just imagine my art there. I don't know what it was. I could even imagine a piece here, a piece there. And I wanted it in all the living areas. I didn't want it to be in a room. I wanted it to be in the kitchen, in the living room, in the, outside on the porch, in, in the bathroom, everywhere where people live. So when you look up, there was a piece of art. Yeah. And I didn't want, I, I, that was one of the conditions. It had to be, it had to be in the living spaces where people spend their time. And another one, I didn't want to have a, a plaque put next to each piece saying what it was. I want people to experience the art from wherever they came from. They might miss the whole point, but yeah. whatever, it, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm not there to, to teach people about art. The art is there to have you experience it from wherever sure. you are. Yeah. And, and then, yeah, and then I didn't want anybody to have to, to pay to do it, to, to go and see. So it is, and I went to visit it many years later. It is all over. It nice. is so beautiful. It really, the, it, it has done something for the place. And I hear that. And it inspires people when they, when they go. I'm going again this uh, January for the Women's Spiritual Retreat. And I, I, I'm happy I get a chance to go and, and see the art again. And you know what's extraordinary about that? is the fact that when you came to America, you had to learn what the black experience was. Absolutely. And yet these African-Americans know nothing of Africa. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, I'm I, called an African-American, but what do I know? Like I, yeah. somebody somewhere came from there, you know? Yeah. But you know, it's through no fault of their own. It's no. Not taught. If you remember in Roots, you know, yeah. uh, Kunta Kinte, you know, he he was beaten because they were giving him a different name. His yep. name was supposed to be Toby. Yep. And he was fighting very hard, but he was absolutely beaten until his yep. name, until he said his name was Toby. Yep. The African culture was beaten out of the slaves who came here and, and the following generations. They were made to be ashamed of it. They were made to disown it. It was never taught in the schools. So, and it is, I, 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 I really compliment them for struggling over all these years to go back to who they were, to reclaim it, to study, mm -hmm. you know. Yet the flip side of that coin for me, when I came here, I knew nothing about African-Americans, literally nothing. Yeah. But there's a chapter, as you know, it's called Becoming Black. I had to learn to become an African-American because everybody treated me as one. I was supposed to represent the entire race. Every right. time there was any discussion in the classroom about anything, about the riots, about civil rights movement, about something happening, they would all look at me. And, and for a long time, I didn't understand what that meant. Until one day they were discussing the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King and someone turned around to me and said, well, what do you people want anyway? So I turned around to look for you people. Yeah, yeah. When I turned back, all eyes were on me and I realized I was you people. So I felt that burden of my skin. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, I don't know anything. I can hardly speak English. <laughs> I am representing, you know. So I realized in America when people saw me, 
I was, was I was black first. That's it. I was not an American. I was not almost not a human being. I yeah. was black. Yeah. And just I would see somebody and say, oh, she's white and she's from so and so. Right. She's black. End of, you know. Yes. Now I could be black and I'm from Africa. Right. But no, you know. So I had to learn. So I learned a lot of uh, about African Americans. And I, I, I was just amazed because we had never learned in Africa when I went to school about slavery. I didn't know any of that. Yeah. But the flip side of this whole thing again for me was all of a sudden I belonged. You know, in Africa, I didn't belong anywhere, but here I was black. Yeah. And I, to me, it was like a gift. It just, oh my God, now I am black. I have a group of people. I have my people. Right. So it, I struggled to, to learn to become who I'm supposed to be on the outside but in the inside i had with me the real who i was which was being an african which the african americans are but yes. they have lost that yes. and just now reclaiming it and just as you had to learn i mean they can always learn too yes yeah and okay. i think they are they you know two extraordinary events that i didn't touch on that i have to touch on before we go because <laughs> they really are pivotal you found out who your mother was and you found out who your father was. Yes. And what an extraordinary tale that is. Yeah, it is. You know, I always say my story would make some soap opera. It's like a fantastic yeah. movie. Yeah. So your mother was a white missionary who lived in yeah. Africa with her husband, yes. her white husband, but had a black lover somehow who was also worked for them. Mm -hmm. And the husband knew about it. Mm -hmm. And they had a child before you, Judy, mm -hmm. who yes. passed away as a young mm -hmm. girl. They had a son who was white, Larry. Yes. And then they had another child. I think they had a miscarriage maybe. And then they had you, yes. who she had to give away. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't make up that story if I tried, you know? Yeah. It, I mean, life yeah. is always stranger than fiction. Yeah. You know, because she, one day... My mother wrote a letter to, to Kathy and said that she wanted to come and see me. And that letter had been sent to Kathy in Onamia, which I told you, the small town in Minnesota, yeah. way up in northern Minnesota. And we had moved, she had moved to the cities for years. That letter stayed for how many weeks in the dead letter box until somebody who remembered Kathy put the right address. We, arrived, we got it six months later. And, uh, and it was my mother. So she, Kathy invited her to come and meet me. And of course, I wanted to meet her. And I always tell the story of how, how it was confusing for me because she, she described what she was going to be wearing and we were watching for everybody coming out of the plane in Minneapolis. And uh, I, I didn't see her. I didn't see her. I was looking for the clothing. I was looking for everything. I just, I, I just did not see it. And then I turned around and Kathy was talking to this woman. And this woman was white. And never in my wildest dreams had I thought my mother was white. I was always looking and praying for my black African mother. So <laughs> I love it. I didn't know. I was really shocked. It yeah. was just like, and then not only that, at that moment, I realized this white woman here was the woman who came at my bedside when I was dying of malaria. Yeah. And she, at that time, it was typhoid when I was a child. And she made arrangements for me to be moved from the African hospital which had literally nothing overcrowded to the European hospital where I had my own bed and I had my own room. And this, this white lady would come and watch me every evening. And I never knew, she never said a word. But when I met her now 36 years later in America, I recognized her as the woman by my bedside when I was seven years old, practically dying from typhoid. And it makes you wonder, why does she want to meet you? She didn't want you to be, she didn't want you to call her mother. No, she, she didn't. didn't. I asked really, her she, didn't yeah. she did not want that. She barely really wanted a relationship in some ways. Yes, no, I, I, I've it, always so wondered bizarre. why, you know? Yeah, she, she sounded really strange. And yet, I mean, she did save you at, at certain points, right? And, she really and, did. And she, she saved me also at a point where it was very, very important. Uh, when Kathy wanted to take me to America, mm -hmm. I had no parents. I had no mother. I had no father. So I didn't have a nationality. I, I couldn't have a passport. What were they going to put down there? No one has a birth at my time. No one sure. has a birth certificate. You know, so I mean, very, very long story short. And it just shows you how all these things are confusing, how my mother was on the scene 
even, even when I was in the orphanage, three years old, being shown for adoption. She yeah. came to look at me, but never touched me or anything. So she's always kept track of me. And so when Kathy finally decided, many people wanted to adopt me, but she always said no, because the nuns knew where she was and they asked and they contacted so her and she said no. When Kathy wanted to adopt me, she said yes. So Kathy went to the orphanage and, and asked them if there was any way they could help get me a citizenship or a passport. And they contacted my mother, who in turn went to the state, you know, the, the state house in, in Dar es Salaam, the capital, and vouched that she was an American and I was her daughter and I got an American passport. So that was huge what she huge. did for me. I don't yeah. know if I could have left the country. And then eventually, years passed, she let you meet your brother, Larry. Yes. And somehow the two of you, after your mom passed away, figured out who your father could be. Yeah. And you go he back. figured it out, yeah. And, yeah, and then you go back mm -hmm. to, to Africa, the two of you on a safari. Yes. And and you find Jeremiah, yes, your father. Absolutely, because that was just meant to be. It was just like yeah, the blind leading the blind leading the blind. You know, my my brother, my half brother Larry, uh, he was brought up there. He was yeah. brought up, and 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 whoever turned to be my father, it was was their cook. So. So he remembered people who used to work for them all those years. And we had to travel all over the country and eliminate them one by one by one. And the last one, when we had given up, we'd gone to the village where we were told he was and we were turning around, we we're coming back home. Well, we did our best, we, did, we couldn't find him. Every, everything, just, it's just like a miracle how that whole scene happened that in the end, we end up finding him and he is my father and we develop a really good relationship. Amazing. And he's the one who, who got, really got to fill in the blanks for you because yes. your father wasn't saying anything. But my mother was, he, she didn't want to talk about even the good things about Africa. She never talked about, every time we talked, she, she didn't want to tell us anything. She took a, she took a heart pill. Yes. <laughs> so, and, yeah. yeah, she did in China. <laughs> in China, yeah. But my father told me a whole lot more than I even could dream. And, and, and he put it all together. And when you come to read book three, yeah. it, it, as I, I know you have, you know, it is, it is really, I always, every so often, I compare it to the movie Get Out, mm -hmm. you know, and because it is, it, it is just unreal how, how, how Africans were managed at that time yeah. and yeah. kind of told what to do, what, you know, like, like my, uh, my mother and her husband, they all were in cahoots with, with my father taking care of her and, and I just don't know how it happened. So my, my father told me a whole bunch of things and, and I put two and two together. And in the end, in the book, I realized what really happened. Yeah. And it's bizarre, especially at that time. Very bizarre. You know, it's, it's, I, I recently wrote my father's story and he's still alive, but I wrote the book for him and he was, he had come to visit me and he was reading the book and he, and I could hear him chuckling in the other room. I go, dad, what's so funny? He goes, mm -hmm. you know, he goes, it's all true, but I can't believe it's me. And I, I have a feeling like you read your books, you know, and you go, it's, I can't believe this was my life. It's funny that you should say that, you know, because I can't tell you how often I feel like whatever I've written and all those things that I've experienced, I just feel like it happened to somebody else and I'm just chronicling. I don't believe it was actually me and I very seldom feel like, I went through that. It is just these things happened and I was the witness to it. And yeah. I managed to keep it in, to remember it. But I, and, and when I, I look back now and I see where I am now, and like I began, I, I started out loving myself. And like right now, I always, like the book ends with me always saying, no matter what, you have to, to love yourself. So I have yeah. loved myself through all of that. And what has remained in the aftermath of all the trauma, all the difficulty, all the things I've went through, what has always been there and has always remained is the love I had for myself. So that no matter what happened, I, ha I can always fall back to me and I can almost disassociate with that, but connect with, with who I am and, and my authentic self and, and who I love. And I, if there's one thing I always tell people, I don't know, it seems some, 
some people find it difficult to love themselves. I think I did because I had no choice. Sure, you had no one you else know? to love you. But I, I tell people to love themselves, but they got to be brave. It's not, it's not easy. No. Because especially in my case, when the society told me everything was wrong with me. Sure. You know, so, so I tell people just, you have to hang on in there. You have to start with yourself, but you have to bravely love yourself. Loving yourself is not selfishness. It is nothing to do with that. Loving yourself is respecting yourself and knowing your worth. And yeah. you're just as worthy as the other person over there. And you have to start with that. But I found all through my life, I had to really be brave in loving myself. And I think I've succeeded. For sure you succeeded. Now, the, the name Nambu, your father asked you to take this name to America. Yeah. He wanted his name to live in America. I didn't know what he meant by that. Was that his last name or was it? A, 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 That's his last name. That it is was the, the last name. name. The yeah, family name. His first name, name was, was Yeremia and uh, last name was Nambu. So Nambu. he was glad he had a child in America. And even though I, when I met him, I thought, you know, he had dreamed of America. I told him, well, we'll take you to America. He did not want to come. He said he just wanted his name to live in America. That's funny. So when I came here, I, I took it as a, you know, I, I had only one last name and I added it as my, as a middle name and, and my children also changed their names and added. So, Beautiful. you know, so his name is living. And then the, the biggest surprise of all is when I went to, to Haley Farm to visit, uh, to see the art. When I walked there, I was just blown away because there, there were signs everywhere that says the Nambu collection. Nice. Of African art. So I felt, oh yeah, my father is being honored. Yeah. So I've, I've managed to have his name live here. Nice. You know, even in that small way. And it, that is a big way because it, it was a total surprise. It made me really happy that, I, I, that something came out of that request. Well, I have to say three things. First of all, fantastic author you are a great writer everybody i know you know from the reviews and from myself couldn't put the books down like they they are phenomenal books so kudos to you for for really a wonderful job at writing it's not just a great story it was written well so good for you on that and people can get your books um on amazon and in all the usual book places that people can get books and you have a website and what's yeah. your what's your website my okay. website is marianambu.com. My name, you know, when people forget that there's an H, so it is yeah. Maria N H A M B U dot com. And and the um the soul dancing. Do you do you have um the aerobics with soul? Yes, I also have a do other have videos website which is aerobicswithsoul.com and that talks all about the fitness program that I developed based on African dancing. So are there CDs that people can buy if they yeah, want they, to? Yeah, uh, they used to be CDs. They used to be, the, first of all, it started, you know, with, with, the, with the VHS. Sure, you know? of and course. They went to CDs, they went to DVDs. And now there's just a link that they download, you know, they go online. Yep. And they, they can download the link. Awesome. To the there are two videos over there. There's a beginning and an, intermediate and, and an advanced that they can download and work out at home on their, put it on their device and work out on their own. So we've actually can't believe we've run out of time. However, what's next for you? Oh, I have a, you know, a fantasy to, uh, to write a children's book based on Fat Mary. Oh, that'd be awesome. I have no idea how to do it because the concept, I only now that I'm trying to write a children's book, am I realizing how deep and how, I don't know how... Uh, how that concept, I don't know. It, it's very difficult to put into words and I'm trying to figure out how did I come up with it when I was so small? There must, and, and I want to do it so that children can learn from when they're very little that they, it, sometimes they think they can do nothing. Sometimes they think they have to depend on their parents, on their big sister or anything. I want children to start from when they're very little to go within and to get familiar with themselves and to get familiar with their little strengths, no matter what they are at that point. So I, I, I would love to write a children's book based on Fat Mary, but I, I'm having real trouble because I don't even know where to begin. We're going to talk, but we're going to talk off air. Facebook, goodbye. That was Maria Nambu. Please go and visit her on, on her website and go to Amazon and get her books, Africa's Child. It's a trilogy, Africa's Child, America's Daughter, and Drum Beats, Heartbeats. Goodbye. We're going to go off 
Facebook right now and we're going to stop the live stream. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to stop this recording.